the church calendar. This is Holy Week, and we are starting today with Palm Sunday, where we traditionally recognize the moment where Jesus walks into Jerusalem on the back of foil of a donkey and begins the moment towards the cross that ends with the resurrection, the, the taking upon the sins of mankind upon himself, the defeating of, of death and destruction, and then rising again three days later on Resurrection Sunday. It is a very, very, very powerful week in the life of the church, the global church. And it's also a powerful week just on its own because of you and your life and whatever it is that you're going through and who you are and your story. And all these things sort of blend together and they land and they layer on top of each other to make for a, a wonderful time of fellowship, of hanging out, of doing life together and learning and growing and doing and being. It is so exciting to be here with you. You can tell I'm really, really, really jazzed. My hair is moving. We're we're, we're in it right now. We're 10 toes deep in it. If you are on our Discord server, hello and welcome to you. One of my favorite things on Sunday mornings is opening up Discord and friends already saying hello to one another and greeting one another even before the, the gathering starts. We always look at Discord as sort of like the, the lobby space. If you've ever been inside a, a, a theater, if you've ever gone to a show, or if you've ever gone you've been inside a, a, a church building, you know there's a lot of mulling around that happens in the lobby before service and then sort of like okay it's time for us to go in and go and hang out and so like that feels good mornings always remind me of the time when you're walking into a place and you're saying hi to people before you actually go in and take your seat and so if you're on our discord server we're so uh, grateful to have you there and if you're in our youtube chat we're so grateful to have you there as well and so wherever you are if you're on discord if you're on youtube stop for a second take out your fingers put them on your keypad or on your iPad pad. iPad pad? Is that, is that what we we'll call it? An iPad pad? iPad, whatever. Or your phone. And type in a hello, a where are you from, a what are you doing. Maybe you want to type in some of your Easter traditions. Maybe there's a tradition that you do with your family leading into Holy Week. Maybe there's something that you incorporate into your lives. Something that I incorporate into into mine. It's every year I read um, this book. It's called uh, Christians at the Cross by N.T. Wright, and it's a a devotional that goes through every day of Holy Week. And there's something, there's scriptures to read, and there's stories that are being told, and there's little sermons that are written for every single day of of Holy Week. And since today is Palm Sunday, I wanted to read a, a portion of a little a little paragraph of it for us to be able to kind of center our minds as we begin to prepare ourselves for for musical worship as we begin to prepare ourselves for teaching my homegirl jenny she's gonna be bringing a, a, a really timely teaching this morning it's gonna be great before we do that let's kind of center ourselves in, in terms of this week as we're going on this journey towards the cross and resurrection and so uh, nc right he writes this when it comes to palm sunday and you can imagine the scene if you if you ever if you ever um have read it before in the Gospels, it's a parade of sorts, and Jesus and his disciples, they are making their way towards Jerusalem. Jesus is on the back of a, of a baby donkey, foil of a donkey. Is it a baby donkey? Yeah, it is. And people are waving palm branches, and they're putting their, throwing their jackets, their, their, their outer garments on the ground. And it's a party, and they're singing, and they're, and they're chanting. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing time, and you can imagine in a crowd of people, there's different people going through different things. If you've ever been to a parade, you can imagine that everybody, even if they're cheering for whomever is in the center of the road, you're still bringing your own life into that moment as well. And even if you're ignoring what you're going through for a moment or two, it's still there. And so with that being said, this is what N.T. Wright says. We come, us, like the crowds on Palm Sunday, with all kinds of hopes and frustrations, with sorrows and fears, and we have that glimmer of hope that maybe Jesus will be able to do something about it all. Isn't that why we gather together? Isn't that why we do community together? We do that because we hope that in the midst of learning and leaning on one another and laughing and singing and meditating, that somehow in the midst of everything that we're going through, Jesus will come alongside us 
and help us make sense about all it is that we are are going through. And so maybe this morning you need today. Maybe this morning, unlike any other morning on this Palm Sunday, you need this moment to pause and say, Jesus, I bring everything that I'm going through to you because I don't know what to do. Can you make sense of it all? Maybe it's direction. Maybe it's a need that you have. Whatever it is, you can bring that. And we, we come with all of those complexities of our lives, our good and our bad and our ugly. Say, so, Jesus, can you help make sense of it? And you know what he does in these moments? While he's parading down the road towards destiny, he stops and he checks in on us and he invites us to do the same thing with one another, check in on one another as well. Let's prepare to give, shall we? And maybe that's a part of it. Maybe it's bringing our giving as well, bringing our finances and something that we've done before in our live stream is we've thought for a couple of moments and we've symbolically held our our giving and we've stretched our hands out towards towards God. And we said, God, can you make something out of this? Out of what you've given me, may you multiply this. May you make something out of, out of this that impacts my church, that impacts my community, that impacts the world around me, that impacts a world that I can't even see. Why don't we extend that to him today and, and pray that he does what only he can do, which is extend and impact far beyond our own reach. Jesus, we thank you that we have been given so much. Even if it feels like we have nothing, we've been given so much. And out of what we have, Lord, we give it over to you, Lord. May you make something out of it. In our lives, Lord, the lives of my friends, as we come with our hopes and our fears, our, our worries, our dreams, we come to you on this Sunday, asking you to do something about it all. And we thank you that you always do in your time and in your way, you always do. For that, we say thank you. Bless our time of singing. Bless our time of giving, we pray. And bless Jenny as she she brings uh, a, a fresh teaching to us. May we receive that with, with joy, with kindness, and with openness. In your name, amen. Let's sing together. But to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind. Say so long to my old friends, burden and bitterness. You can just keep on moving. No, you ain't welcome here.
my soul, my soul, my sing. My soul, my soul, my sing. Beautiful one, my soul. My soul, my soul, my sing. My soul, my soul, my sing. My soul, my soul, my sing. Beautiful one. I thank the Savior because you healed my heart. You changed my name forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. I thank God. We thank you, Jesus. With a melody, you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb chosen me love has called my name see I've been born again into your family this blood flows through my veins sing I'm no longer to these words this morning. I am surrounded by the arms of the Father. See, I am surrounded by song.
We're going to celebrate with one more song together. There's something so uplifting about those words. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. There's nothing too big. There's nothing too far. I am never too far gone. But I'm ever out of his love. All right, let's sing this last song together. tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. When the waters rise, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart,
About a year ago at this time, in Canada and the US and around the world, we witnessed a great move of God through the Holy Spirit. It was on February 8th in the great state of Kentucky to our brothers and sisters uh, to the south. And it started actually just with a couple of students at a Christian liberal, liberal arts college that decided to stay around after a chapel service, um, a regularly scheduled chapel service, a very normal regularly scheduled chapel service to pray and to confess and to worship. Now, was there anything that like happened at the root of that? As the, the story goes and as like history, current history has recorded, not really, it was one student who decided something's happening in me and I just need to stick around, pray and process what's happening in my own heart. And then that also carried out into the hearts of a few others and a few others and a few others. And then by the afternoon, the president of this college sent out a nine word email that said this, and this got the whole thing rolling. There's worship happening in Hughes, the, the chapel where they, they had gathered. There's worship happening in Hughes. You're welcome to come and join. There's worship happening in Hughes Chapel. You're welcome to come and join. And then over the next two weeks, 70,000 people came and joined. Now, what was this blessing, this revival, some mm -hmm. are calling it. What was this move of the spirit marked by? Um, hearts that were broken and open to the work of Jesus, the manifestation, the outworking of the spirit, the spirit's leading. Hearts that were shifted towards prayer of slowing down and stopping the busyness of activity and turning, turning our attention to, to God. And then hearts that were willing, wanting to be transformed, moved into the likeness of Christ, inviting as many people as possible. So people who wanted to stay, and be in the presence of God, to be changed by the Spirit of God, to be led by the Spirit of God in prayer, and then to be inviting others into this movement of the Spirit of God. And over 14 days, 70,000 people descended literally on this very small college and witnessed a very subdued, gentle, but deeply personal act of the Spirit of God called the Asbury Revival. Now, what does that do for you as you hear it? Do we want this? I will admit in my tradition, uh, growing up in a very conservative Christian home and framework, mm -hmm. that does get a little like, oh, okay, how do you test it? How do you measure it? Did that really happen? Who was there? How, how, did, how was it recorded? What are the details? And can this be proven right? But this is often how the spirit uh, works. It's not with like, grandiose gestures. Sometimes it is. In fact, the book of Acts records like miracles and these like these real proofs of the work of God. But most times throughout Christian history, including in the book of Acts, the work of the spirit is to remind us of the presence of God in Jesus, is to transform us into the likeness of God in Jesus, and is to include everybody possible in the work of God in Jesus by the Holy Spirit. And so we as a church uh, in this series and in the life of our church right now are saying we want to be a spirit-led community. But, but, but let me ask us again, do we actually want this? Are we open to the work of the spirit that will draw us to worship, that will break our hearts in confession and prayer, and that will move us on the path towards Jesus' likeness in order to include as many people as possible? In our day and age, in this moment uh, in the life of our church, do we want this? So who is this lovely human to my do left? This is, this? Do you want this, Jenny? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> uh, this is yeah. my friend Jenny. She is our Ottawa lead pastor. And uh, you have done quite a bit of work over the last little while, personally for sure, but also mm -hmm. in your kind of like side hustle vocation of spiritual direction. So mm -hmm. when you hear that kind of story, and, and I know you've read about it as well. A little, yeah. What, what does that do for you? Like what is conjured up in your, in your spirit? I think first it's, it's the reminder that sometimes the things we hear about as big spiritual movements of the past are not only in the past. The spirit moves now, yeah. and part of our job is to be aware of it. Present for it, mm -hmm. yeah. And then talk to me a little bit, talk to us a little bit about spiritual direction, literally spiritual guide for mm. people who are on the path together towards the work of the Holy Spirit who transforms us into the likeness mm -hmm. of Jesus. Big, long definition, yeah. but Spiritual direction is a, it's a fun 
word because it's got the word direction in it, but it's actually not directive from the person guiding the facilitation of that, that meeting. And so it's usually like an hour long session with a director and a directee, but it's actually a three person situation because the Holy Spirit is present yeah. and it's space where you just, um, I've been learning and training to hold that space well, mm. to ask questions and make space for the Holy Spirit to move in the directee's life at the pace and at the topic that the Holy Spirit leads in. And yeah. it's been very fascinating to observe. Mm. It's a lot of letting go. Yeah. I'm sure. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm so excited to learn from you and for us to learn from our sister and spiritual guide director as it relates to like, what does this mean to be led by, transformed by, shaped by the Holy Spirit into the full likeness of Christ for us as a church as we move forward. So I'm, I'm going to pray for you and then I'm so excited to listen and learn from you. So prayer. let's pray. Jesus, thank you for our sister here, for the ways that you are <laughs> shaping her by your spirit. And may you infuse her words with power by your spirit as we listen and learn more about you, Jesus about your mission and your way and about what you have to say to us now in this moment as a church that wants to be spirit-led. In Jesus' name, together we all said, amen. Amen. Who amen. You? Thank you. Well, first, I definitely have to say hello, Ottawa. That is my home site. I've been there for 15 years, and you're a beautiful community. I've learned so much about the Holy Spirit through you, and I'm excited to share some of that here. My first question is, what does a Holy Spirit-led church look like to you? When you hear that, what comes up for you? And is that something that is appealing, intimidating, comfortable, new? Um, a lot of us come to the Holy Spirit with non-neutrality. I think as humans, we don't come to anything with neutrality. And part of our, our job is to sort out what are our lenses? What baggage do we bring? What beauty do we already see that we're bringing to the table? It's not only negative things that we bring to the table. And so I just encourage you to take a moment and consider when you hear the phrase Holy Spirit, do you think of something extremely charismatic? And do you think of something very quiet and contemplative? Do you think of somebody that literally hears a voice speaking to them? Or is it for you something that's been a bit mysterious and you've heard other people talk about it and you kind of feel like, I don't, this doesn't really make sense to me. I haven't experienced this in a way that's clear, but I want to know more. So let's dive in. We're going to look at John 14. I'll read verses 15 to 31 to get us started. And I'm looking at the NIV just as a heads up. Um, so this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. Uh, they're in the thick of the Last Supper. Judas has just been in the chapter before. Um, not called out directly by name, but Jesus has said, one of you is going to betray me. People are feeling a little bit overwhelmed. Jesus is talking about leaving them. They're not totally clear on what's happening. We get, I mean, Good Friday's coming up, Easter's coming up in a week. We get the gift of that whole story. But right now the disciples are in the thick of what are you, what are you talking about Jesus? Why are you leaving us? What are we going to do? So he's trying to comfort them. Um, and so I'm starting in verse 15 of John chapter 14. Jesus says to his disciples, if you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live. You also will live on that day. You will realize that I am in my father and you are in me and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them, is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, bracket, not Judas Iscariot. I love that stuff. <laughs> Whoever wrote this was like, I just want to be clear which Judas we're talking about here. Then Judas said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the father who sent me. All this I've spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. 
I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. And then they move into their next place. Reading through this, I don't know if you picked up in this, but there's a pretty strong theme of, if you love me, keep my commands. And so when I first read this, I felt a little bit of resistance, I'll be honest, because as a second born child with a little bit of a resilient, resistive spirit, it's not really my default to hear hear a command and then be like, you know what I want to do? Exactly what that person just told me to do. (laughs) That's not how I function. That is a delightful character flaw that I work on. And now that I have a toddler, you know, it's humbling. Um, But as I read this, if you love me, keep my commands. I sat with that for a long time. It's mentioned four or five times in this passage. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Anyone who does not love me does not obey my teaching. There's a lot of this love, obedience, love, obedience pairing. And so I'll parse it out a little bit in a moment, but if nothing else, I want us to know Jesus models love and obedience to the father. And then he's calling us to do the same. Everything that he's asking us to do, he's modeling with the father. He loves the father. He's obeying the father. And as he's alluding to here, talking about um, verse 31, the world may learn that I love the father and do exactly what my father commanded me. Jesus prays to not have to follow through with the whole Good Friday and Easter story, but he still obeys. He loves the father through obedience. Jesus also models and explicitly directly explains oneness with the father. Verse 23, he talks about my father will love them and we, me and my father will come to them and make our plural home with them. Jesus and the father are tight. They are one. And we're not going to dive into Trinitarian theology because that's beyond my understanding. But what I want to take out of that modeling of oneness with the father is that we are also included in that. There's, um, I'm not catching the verse quickly with my highlighter. I guess I didn't choose the right color for that one, but there's a verse about whoever's in, yeah, verse 20. On that day, you'll realize I am in my father. You're on me. I am in you. Jesus is inviting us into that close relationship with the father. And then, and this is where the Holy Spirit comes in to carry forward that tangibility of relationship He gifts us the Holy Spirit. He asks the Father. He doesn't just send it by himself. He asks the Father who he's one with to gift us the advocate, the Holy Spirit. This comes up in verse 16, 17, and 26 to be our tangible presence with us. And at Christmas, we talk about Jesus being God with us, Emmanuel. That's what that means. As I read this passage, the phrase came to me that Jesus is God with us and then the Holy Spirit is God and Jesus with us. It's like the next layer, Emmanuel 2.0 of togetherness with God that we as Christians, as people, as created images of God in 2024, we get to receive that tangible presence with us in a way that, I mean, as a kid growing up, I didn't really think about this. I felt like Jesus had his time on earth. Those people got to be lucky enough to experience Jesus in the flesh, God in the flesh, Um, total connectedness to who God is, but we also have that through the Holy Spirit. And what a spirit-led church looks like, I think, is first and foremost being very aware that that is real and that that is happening in our midst. I want to parse out a little bit about love and obedience and then talk about how, how does the Holy Spirit, like how do we actually connect with that? Because it's still pretty mysterious. But love and obedience stood out to me, as I've mentioned, partially because I was resistant to it. And when somebody once told me, whenever you feel resistance, just lean in a little, see what's happening there. There's usually something to learn either about yourself or what it is that you don't want to learn, et cetera. But love and obedience, I thought about, especially in the context of comfort, if my husband said to me, if you love me, keep my commands, that conversation would not go well. I'll just let you know that right now. And my husband and I have a wonderful mutual respect. We love each other, 
but that's not, that's not the dynamic. It's not like an, an hierarchy. But then I thought about my daughter, who's three and a half. I don't say, if you love me, keep my commands. But when she does obey me, I feel very loved. I feel like she sees that I'm trying to help her, to nourish her, to be the best version of herself she can be, to be safe, to be um, within good guardrails, to be creative, to figure out who she is. And I give her guidance around that, commands, things to obey. And as I was thinking about this, my relationship with Jesus is much more like I'm the child and he's the father. I mean, he talks about that word right in here. And that helps me to understand love and obedience being connected in that way, um, rather than feeling like it's a to-do list to prove your love in some way. And then I thought about faith and works. And as Anabaptists, one of our core, like original passionate topics is that faith and works cannot be separated. If you have faith, if you have, I'm going to also parallel this to love for Jesus, it can't stop there. It's not full unless there's some sort of fruit that comes out of it. And so when I think about loving Jesus, if I'm sitting by myself at home, loving, feeling like I love Jesus, I, I, I appreciate his gifts to me. I appreciate grace. I appreciate forgiveness, but then that's it. I just stay home. I don't share that out. I don't have the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Might as well list them all. If I don't live those out, that's what lets people know. That's what lets Jesus know, but that's also what lets the world know that I love Jesus. And so in our Anabaptist tradition, I think these ideas of your faith leading to action, to works, to fruit, and our love leading to obedience are quite intertwined. And I also wanted to point out, um, when I heard the word obedience, I think a little bit of the old covenant where there was a list of laws and a list of what to do is what not to do is very black and white, very check boxable, which for some of us is very comfortable, but love in the new Testament, in our new covenant, we're given this gift of discernment, which the Holy spirit helps us to do well. If we're attuned and listening and being able to obey God by discerning what is loving given our current skills, gifts, context, community needs around us, that is a much bigger, more beautiful and more empowering to me way to say, if you love me, keep my commands because the commands that he leaves us with ultimately are to love God and love others. And that is both a very simple checklist in the fact that it's two items, but a very complicated checklist because it's going to look like a million different things over our lifetime. And so as I hear love and obedience, and I think about our Anabaptist faith and works being so deeply intertwined, the old covenant being shifted into a new covenant of closeness and tangibility of interaction with the Holy Spirit, as well as discernment to know what is the best way to love others? What is the best way to love God? given our context. Um, the next question is, well, then how, how do we know what the Holy Spirit's saying? My husband is somebody who, um, as we were talking about this, doesn't, doesn't really feel like he hears the spirit in that way. I have some other friends who feel very in tune. They just have this sense of like, somebody once shared a prophecy for me. They said, I, are you comfortable if I share um, I just had this vision that I felt I should share with you. It might be something, it might be nothing, but I'd just like to share it. And yeah, sure. I, I loved it. It was very interesting and appropriate to the time, but that the Holy Spirit communicates in so many different ways, but I'll give you a few small pieces. First of all, as Jimmy alluded, sometimes it can be big and dramatic. The gifts of the spirit are diverse. Some of them are very loud and upfront and some of them are very quiet and subtle and behind the scenes. Um, but it's generally, I think, slow and gentle. When I first started officially working in ministry, making that leap from volunteer to work, somebody said to me, my first boss, um, I just want you to know that generally ministry feels slower than you expect it to feel. And it was not all a negative comment, but just an invitation to never rush and to move at the pace that 
people are valued at. The Holy Spirit values people so deeply. And sometimes when we are trying to learn or grow or develop programs or any, anything really, we have a tendency to rush and want to achieve and improve. And I think our culture really pushes this in on us and accentuates our desire to do that. But the Holy Spirit is so gentle. It's relationship first. As Jesus talks about being so close to the Father, one with the Father, us in them, he in us, the Holy Spirit with us forever, it says, teaching and reminding. It's gentle. It's so gentle. And so if, if your experience is that it feels like, oh, I want to hear from the Spirit. Nothing ever happens. It's slow. I think that that is a gift that we need in our cultural moment, to use a fun phrase, where we need to sometimes be challenged to slow down enough because it forces us to let go of our sense of power and control and to really listen to what the Spirit's saying and not maybe what we hope the Spirit is saying. So then, in the Spirit actually communicating with us, I think that can happen in a myriad of ways. One is just directly. Um, for me personally, over the years I've noticed when I've been in a, like a home church setting and I feel like I don't know, the conversation's happening and I kind of feel like I should say something. I kind of get like a, almost like butterflies in my stomach. And I don't really get that for much else. I'm not a very nervous person, which I'm grateful for. Um, being eight months pregnant, it's a little harder to discern sometimes right now because there's a lot of other things happening in my abdomen. But generally, the Holy Spirit moves for me with a little bit of a butterflies in my stomach feeling. And that I've learned over time lets me know this is something like the Holy Spirit wants me to say something about this. Sometimes this has happened in work meetings where I feel like, oh, I don't, I don't know if I should speak up, but then there's like this butterfly feeling. And if I pause and it goes away, then I know it's like food, breakfast, whatever happened. But if I pause it often, if it's, if it's the Holy Spirit in my experience, will get stronger and it doesn't go away until the thing that I've, said has been said. And then it goes away. And I, I sort of have this peace in my soul. Like, I don't know who that was going to help or if that was even helpful, but I just feel like I've been led to say something. So I say it and then I have to just leave it with God, leave it with that group. Sometimes I have thought I have felt that and rushed a little bit to share or felt like, yeah, that's a good thought. That's going to come across as helpful or insightful or whatever. And then I share the thought and then I have a sense, a bit of a sinking sense, like, oh, actually that came from pride. That was not the Holy Spirit. That was just me wanting to contribute, wanting to be seen as contributing. And so I encourage you to take note of kind of what's happening in your body. Some people, I um, know somebody who describes it as a tingling in the back. Don't know why. I'm sure there are a myriad of ways for the Holy Spirit to communicate directly. For me, it's this physical sensation. For some people, it's literally hearing. For some people, it's an image popping into their mind, but that's one way. Another way is through scripture. Of course, the Holy Spirit moves through scripture. We, I was having a conversation with somebody last night and they were expressing their delight at how alive the Bible has felt to them recently as they've been reading through some, some reading plans and having these interesting conversations with a group of people as they walk through that together. And I have experienced this more in the past five years than the beginning of my life, where I'll look at a passage and I have read it before. There are some things that I understand about it. Like there's some core things, but then there's a piece that will pop out. Or even in studying this passage, noticing that love and obedience was something that really stood out for me in this preparation for this message. And I think the Holy Spirit is what makes the scripture alive. As we read something, um, it's not shifting in the sense that it's not stable, but it's shifting in the sense of what draws your attention this time. As you read through a Psalm, you might have one line that just totally points to where you are and you feel seen and understood. And I think that's the Holy Spirit comforting you. Sometimes you'll read a line and it will be clearly compelling that that's something that the Holy Spirit's calling you out on. And you might need to in community or with prayer, figure out what the next step is for you as this, as the scripture has morphed into communicating with you at that time where you are right now. And so I encourage you, if you sometimes feel like the scripture is 
Um, it can be a dry place if you haven't had that experience, but invite the Holy Spirit. Say, I, I'm here. I'm opening your word. Show me. Show me what you have for me today. And I'd also just like to caveat, we do not control the Holy Spirit. They will do what they do. And it will sometimes be at our request, and it will sometimes be totally surprising and unexpected. So it's also, I think, a practice of regularly making that space available. Another way the Holy Spirit speaks to us is through each other. I shared my story briefly about a friend and prophecy. And sometimes people have said something to me that has been so deeply encouraging, and they don't have a clue because it was an offhand comment that they made, but something about it just really hit home to me in that space. And I encourage us to be willing and aware to be that to each other, as especially in a church community setting, but to everyone in our lives. I think that's one of the ways that we bear the image of God is holding space for, as we are aware, like in spiritual direction, trying, trying my best to be attuned to the spirit and offer what the spirit's offering me and trying to put my own thoughts and assessments and opinions aside to do that. Also our experiences, sometimes the Holy Spirit speaks through that. And sometimes if you've seen Mean Girls, you'll recognize the quote, the limit does not exist. These are a handful of ways that the Holy Spirit can communicate with us. But the Holy Spirit is beyond our understanding, beyond our capacity to limit with language. We are, even as I talk about this, I feel right at the end, the edge of what language can offer to describe the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit can move through anything. It can, I've had conversations with people who talk about a particular part of nature just lets them know. God loves them, or um, it can it can be as random as I've had I've had great spiritual experiences waiting in line at the grocery store and just feeling called to practice literally live out the fruit of the spirit of patience. I mean, Christmas time it's busy, stuff goes wild. You're waiting, you're waiting, you've got things to do, but literally those mundane moments, the spirit can move in anything, and so. I really want to emphasize that the limit of the Holy Spirit does not exist. And sometimes as I open with that question about what are the lenses and baggage that we might be bringing to the table with this conversation, being aware of that gives us the freedom to let go of that and just be able to see and be aware of the Holy Spirit working however, wherever, whenever they are. So Jesus' ministry, back to John and a little bit all the Gospels, Jesus' ministry was spirit-filled and spirit-led. Um, when Jesus first goes into the, the desert and spends 40 days being tempted by Satan, it talks about he was spirit-filled and the spirit led him into the desert. He started, like his, everything started. His baptism, the spirit descended on him from the Father. That's, I feel like, modeling for this passage in John 14, right off the bat, almost like a little Easter egg for us in the Bible. Jesus is known by his love and obedience to the Father. He talks about that a lot in here. He models it for us. And he shares the Holy Spirit with those around him. Um, a couple of chapters after this passage that I read, John 20, 22, he is the literal moment where he breathes the Holy Spirit on his disciples. Now that we've been through the past few years of global health challenges, this idea of like breathing on felt a little like, I hope he brushed his teeth. Like, I don't like Jesus just breathed on them. What does that look like? How does that feel? Um, but in conversation, I was reminded that Genesis 1, 2, the second verse of the whole Bible, um, the spirit of God, that breath, that I, Hebrew word ruach, is what's hovering over the waters, what's hovering over that chaos and that deep. And that is where order and beauty and relationship starts. And so as Jesus breathes on his disciples, actively breathing this Holy Spirit, this Holy breath on them, that is where for us as humans, that really tangible Holy Spirit gift, Jesus and God with us forever starts. And it's a beautiful reference to the beginning of creation and God's ideal of being in close, close, close relationship with him as the original plan. So our ministry, our church, our spirit ledness, um, I think needs to be shown by our love and obedience to God, to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit, like Jesus was for the father. 
And we need to share that with people immediately around us. Do not go breathing on people and like saying, here's the Holy Spirit. That will never be helpful. I'm sure you can all discern that. But we are very actively called to share Jesus with others. And I think a lot of that is through loving God and being obedient to his command to love others as well. So the original question that this whole message came out of, what does a spirit-led church look like? More specifically, what can our church look like as we aim to be and move towards being more and more spirit-led? It's always going to be a spectrum. We're never going to be like spirit-led, check, but we're always going to be learning, and I hope always choosing to consider how can we make more space for the spirit? How have we maybe missed something? How are we moving closer to being even more in tune with the Holy Spirit? And so I'd like to close with a few bullet points that are not exhaustive, definitely not exhaustive. The first one is that we have individual Holy Spirit relationships, one by one, each of us interacting with the Holy Spirit, and that those culminate in a community into a healthy community Holy Spirit relationship. If we haven't done the work of being aware of how the Spirit moves in each of our lives, how can we discern together? And I know that some of our sites have done um, in January, that kind of work, spending time getting together evening by evening for a week or spending time praying actively through the same things at the same time to hear what the Holy Spirit's saying. And that to me is a wonderful example of how this can work. I think our local leadership teams, as we have pockets of people discerning um, practical things like budget and staffing and vision for their particular site in their church, that's another way that the Holy Spirit can move and be invited and needs to be central for us to be a healthy community. But if you come to those tables and you haven't experienced or practiced or started to invite and try to be aware of the Holy Spirit on your own, I think that, that that's a bit of a, a, an impasse. That's something that we need to do individually and together. As I've said many times, I think we need to love and we need to obey. And we need to, with our Holy Spirit relationship discernment, figuring out how the Holy Spirit communicates with us, discern what that looks like and be willing for that to change. Because what we were called to as the meeting house 10 years ago is not what we're called to as the meeting house right now. And I'm not gonna declare what we're called to because that's bigger than I can know by myself, but as a community, we're sorting that out in Ottawa. We're sorting that out for Ottawa. In Halton Peel, you're sorting that out for Halton Peel, et cetera, et cetera. And then as a whole community, we're sorting that out for the meeting house. And it's been very interesting and beautiful to be a part of that and to watch that happening. Um, I'm going to touch briefly on the Holy Spirit gifts, which is a topic that could be a lifelong study in and of itself. But one of the things I love about the Holy Spirit gifts is that there are many of them and nobody has all of them. And this to me hails back again to our Anabaptist um, value of togetherness and flattened power structure. And just by default for all of us to have a gift of the Holy Spirit, to have something that we are supernaturally empowered to do and offer to our community for the edifying and equipping of people getting to know Jesus better. It also means that we have many gaps, spaces that we do not have gifts. And I think being aware of that has been very freeing for me because I can let go of not needing to be everything and invite and be excited about lifting up somebody else's gifts and saying, Hey, you are so the Holy spirit moves through you in this way. How can we bring that to the table? How can we bring all of those different pieces to the table and in the fullness of our diversity become an even more whole body part of Christ. And then the last thing I would love to leave you with again, is that the limit does not exist. The Holy Spirit is going to lead where the Holy Spirit is going to lead. And our, our call is to love and obey. And a lot of that will mean letting go of what we expect the Holy Spirit to do, what we hope the Holy Spirit will do, what we hope God's will is. Um, and it's a beautiful place of, I think in my experiences, surrendering, but then also being surprised by things that we couldn't have imagined or foreseen or predicted. And so as we 
as we go into our week from here, as we go into our home churches and think about what it means to be Holy Spirit led, my hope for you is that you can increase your awareness. Just choose to look around and consider Holy Spirit, where are you? What are you saying? What are you doing? How can I love you? How can I obey you? And also how can I let go of the things that are in my own way that I hope and want you to do and be willing to dive in. The Holy Spirit wants the best for us, much like I said with my toddler analogy at the beginning, the Holy Spirit wants the best for us, much like I want the best for my daughter and is not going to lead us down a path of spiritual dryness or emotional exhaustion or like physical strain. Like these are the Holy Spirit desires wholeness for relationship, for community, for the body. And so let's close with a bit of prayer. Um, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your, your God with us, Jesus with us, Holy Spirit presence that we, we get to receive. It's every, I'm sure the layers that I've, that I've uncovered and absorbed and delighted in up until now in another 20, 30 years, will feel even richer and more beautiful. And I praise you for that non-static relationship that we have with you through your Holy Spirit. I pray for us as we discern what that looks like individually, as churches and as a network. I pray that we would have space in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, in our bodies to to see, to see, to hear, to know, to wonder. And I pray that we would come together as communities and with, with grace and with confidence and with boldness and with vulnerability, share what we are each hearing from you. Because I think our value of community hermeneutic and bringing together all the different pieces that we experience from you, that's one of the most beautiful things that I love about this Anabaptist tradition. And I pray that we would honor you with that today, this week, and in years and years to come. All these things in your beautiful name. Amen. Can we, can we recap a little bit of what Jenny just shared? What does a spirit-led church look like? People, um, uh, people out in the Holy Spirit-led relationships that, call, that, that end up feeding into Holy Spirit-led community. It's loving and obeying together. It's doing life together. It's the idea of flattening the curve. There's no sense of a pyramid of leadership hierarchy, but instead it's everybody mutually empowering one another. And the, the picture of following the Spirit wherever He would lead us. Wherever the Spirit would lead, we would be willing to, to follow, follow that voice, follow that prompting, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful picture. As we get to the the, the back end of, of our of our gathering, obviously we have some announcements and things like that. The reminder that we have a podcast you should check out, that we have Discord that you should be a part of, that you should join a home church. Something about you know, God, healthy community, Holy Spirit led community. Be a part of a home church. And join one. And find us online and find one that works for you. It's so good to be able to to do that. But I can't help but be reminded, as we talked about at the beginning of our gathering, this is Palm Sunday. And Jesus is, is preparing to make his way towards Jerusalem, led by the Spirit, led by destiny, led uh, compelled by the Spirit, compelled by his Father to go into Jerusalem. And so I can't help but wonder, maybe today, instead of saying grace and peace and ending with announcements and things like that, some last minute take homes. We end reading the story of Jesus entering into Jerusalem. And maybe that's our, our benediction today. So would you indulge me for a few extra moments as we read through the scriptures together? Looking at Matthew 21, starting at verse one. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her cold by her, and tie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to your daughter Zion, 
see your king come see you, gentle and riding on the donkey, and on a colt, the foil of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowd that went ahead of him, the crowd that went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. 